and welcome to episode 6 of CS350 Online. I'm your host, Leslie, and in today's episode, we're going to cover semaphores and condition variables. But first, let's take a look at our OS of the day. Which is a very similarly named to the one from a last episode. This one, however, is called DTSS. DTSS stands for Dartmouth Time Sharing System. Now, this operating system was a product of Dartmouth College, and it was released in 1964 to run on the GE200 computers. Now, for those of you who are sitting there wondering, GE, do you mean General Electric? Yes, I mean General Electric. Um, as if you go back in history and you look at the different manufacturers of mainframe computers, you'll actually find a lot of surprises. Uh, for example, Honeywell, which you might associate with the thermostats, in your apartments or your homes, yeah, Honeywell actually used to make mainframe computers. Uh, they also are where the honeypot term comes from. So the Dartmouth time sharing system, this was really the first successful um, operating system to use uh, time sharing. Now they had this uh, desire that no response for any of the users should take more than 10 seconds because they really wanted to provide their users with the illusion that you have your own computer. And at the time, 1964, a 10 second response was really, really fast. Now, of course, to us today, if your computer takes 10 seconds to respond, you assume that your house is burning down and your laptop is crashed and the world has ended. <laughs> so for us, that would be way too long. But in 64, that was actually a really great uh, response time. So they actually used preemption, of course, to implement this. And uh, it was more than that. So they didn't just implement um, time sharing with preemption by accessing the raw hardware and not using any kind of higher level API. They actually made a properly abstracted time sharing. Um, what I mean by that is they wrote a higher level API to actually do this job so that you could actually, you know, offer um, a bit more of security. Um, anyone who's working on this doesn't have to worry so much about the underlying hardware. And because they abstracted a lot of the implementation details from the hardware itself, that actually gave them the ability, if they had so wanted to, to actually move to a different computer because they could just replace a small component instead of the whole component. So that's a really nice feature. Um, which another interesting thing about this operating system is this is one of the first to offer an IDE, so an integrated design environment. So you could actually type lines of code, have them automatically inserted to the program, compiled and executed like right away. It's like hitting that play button. So that's kind of a neat thing. And when they created this operating system, I mean, so many operating systems were created for like a PhD thesis. <laughs> Um, that's how a lot of compilers get created in languages. So they didn't want to just create some operating system and have it sit in a dusty tome on the shelf. They actually wanted to create something that people were going to use. So they set out with this goal to get as many students and faculty members at the university using the OS as possible. And in a period of only four years, they actually managed to get 80% of the students using it. So you might be thinking, oh, Dartmouth must be some big technical school and everybody, of course, wanted to write programs. No, they simply, it, it's not a technical school. They had arts people using it. They had science people using it. They tried to get everybody integrated into a computing environment. And that's a pretty interesting thing. The other thing that's interesting is that this actually remained in operation until the end of 1999. That's pretty impressive. Now, you might be wondering, why would somebody hold on to it that long? Uh, <laughs> some people like to hold on things for a very long period of time. I remember when I was doing my very first co-op term. It was over in physics. And um, a professor had just retired. And we were cleaning out his lab. Well, I wasn't cleaning out the lab. But the other... Um, his grad students were cleaning out the lab and the ancient computing hardware they pulled out of that room. And this would have been January of 2002 was astonishing. Like old Altair machines, uh, stacks and stacks of unopened punch cards, unopened cases of eight inch floppy disks, um, North star 77s, 
which is a small computer. Well, small computer. <laughs> I mean, they, they really pulled out hardware that was 30 and 40 years old. And this guy just kept it. I don't want to say that's actually pretty common. So I'm not surprised this remained in operation until 99. I'm going to guess and say that uh, the Y2K issue is part of the reason why it was decommissioned in, in, in 99. All right. So that's exciting. So where were we at the end of our last episode? So at the end of our last episode... Uh, and I know some of you may not be able to see what I have up here. Uh, so I'm going to switch. Let's, let's go to this one. There you go. Now you can see. So at the end of last episode, we ended up going through the pseudocode for A1 question one. And if you haven't read the assignment, please go read the assignment. But A1 question one, it wants you to implement locks that block. So instead of waiting by repeatedly knocking on the door or disabling interrupts so that to, to minimize spinning, we actually want to put the thread into the sleep state. And this is probably one of the most important parts of your operating system, which is why we are giving you the pseudocode for it. Because if you don't get it correct, nothing is going to work. Nothing. And if it does work, it's because of a race condition and you got lucky. I've seen that, by the way. I have actually seen that. <laughs> but it's really important that you get these to work. So we have the pseudocode here. And I am actually going to post this pseudocode to Piazza. So don't worry if you missed it um, or can't read my handwriting. Unfortunately, writing on one of these you know, little tablets isn't always the neatest thing on earth. But there you go. So we've talked about the stru lock structure, how you need a wait channel, which is where the threads are going to be waiting for the lock to become available. We have to keep track of whether the lock is uh, in use or not. And we need to keep track of the owner because you need to make sure that somebody who is not um, the owner can't release it. The only person who should ever be able to unlock the door is the person who locked it. And then we have a spin lock and the use of the spin lock here is what tends to, one of the things that tends to confuse people about locks. They see the code for acquire and it looks like we're just wrapping a new API around using a spin lock, but that's not actually what we're doing here. We need to have an atomic test and set for the held variable for our lock. So we need some mechanism to actually protect held. Now we could go to straight to the assembly, but I don't want to because going to inline assembly is a pain. It's ugly. Let's just not go there. But hey, we have this tool, this basic building block called a spin lock that we could use to give us the mutual exclusion on held. And since I know that I only need to check the value of held and set it, which is a very simple operation, I know that I would never own the spin lock for very long. So we are gonna use the spin lock here to protect the test and set operation, which is why it is so important that we release the spin lock before we go to sleep. Because if you don't release the spin lock before you go to sleep, then interrupts are disabled. You're asleep, but you're not using a CPU. So, Interrupts are still off. That would be bad. All right. So another question that people often have about our lock implementation is why do we check whether the lock is owned in a loop? And let's go over that one more time just so you can think about it. So when you go to try to acquire a lock, if the lock is not available, you're going to go to sleep. Here's the problem. The only person that can wake you up is the thread that releases the lock. If they come up to you and they touch you on the shoulder and say, okay, wake up, you don't go from sleeping to running. You just don't do that. You're going to go from sleep and you're going to go to the ready pool. So the operating system, the kernel, is going to take you off of the wait channel and it's going to put you into the ready pool but you have not executed a single instruction 
Now, you actually have no control whatsoever over when the kernel is going to select you to run next. So it's entirely possible that in between the releasing thread waking you up and putting you into the ready pool, it's entirely possible that another thread gets scheduled to run before you and ends up taking the lock. So when you actually finally get scheduled to run, the lock, its state may have changed again. So it's really important we check. Now I've had people say, well, you only need to do an if, but this cycle can repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat, especially if you have a lot of contention for the lock. What that means is you've got a lot of threads who are all trying to get the lock at the same time and new threads are trying to get the lock at the same time. If you have a lot of contention for resources, then you may go from blocked to ready and when it's finally your turn to run, this state may have changed and maybe continuously change. Right. Release is fairly straightforward. Uh, you're going to acquire the spin lock. You reset held and the owner and you call wake one. And it's important to call wake one here and not wake all. And that's really because only one thread is permitted to own the lock. It's supposed to offer mutual exclusion. If you wake everybody up and there's 10,000 threads that you wake, then all 10,000 of those threads have to, to wait their turn to run only to realize that the lock isn't available and so they have to go back to sleep again. So that's a really inefficient way of doing things. So we're gonna use wake one here instead. All right, now a couple other things. Make sure that you are putting in appropriate kernel assertions with the kassert macro. Um, and you should be asserting things like the lock is not null, uh, in acquire, make sure you don't already own the lock and in release, make sure you do own the lock and, and so on and so forth. So make sure you're doing those assertions and make sure that you use lock. Do I hold instead of checking the condition directly? All right. So what I'd like to do now, we've shown you the lock test already in our last episode and I've talked about how to test the locks. There are, by the way, no secret tests. Um, we don't use Marcus or Marmoset for any kind of testing. All of your assignments are manually graded and then we upload the, the comments to Marcus when they are ready. Now, you might be worried that you're going to miss out on something um, because you, there might be some secret test. There's no secret tests. For this, we run UW lock test and we run SY2. There you go, there's your lock tests. You have the source code to these. So if you are curious as to what is actually going on, you can open them up, you can run them, don't modify them, um, but you get the point. All right, so now I'd like to go and talk about something else. And that is my good friend, the semaphore. And this is actually my favorite synchronization primitive. And I know it probably seems odd that somebody would have a favorite synchronization primitive, but I mean, you have a favorite editor, right? And you have a favorite web browser. So why can't I have a favorite here? I love semaphores. They're great. So a lock gives us mutual exclusion. So that's going to protect our critical section and uh, pre um, prevent any kind of race conditions. Now, keep in mind, this is not something the operating system is adding for you. This is something that you're going to have to use and use correctly in your own code. But sometimes maybe I do want multiple threads into the critical section. Now, maybe that doesn't make sense to you, but there's some different ways to think of it. So let's suppose, and I know this is like this distant memory you might have had, but once upon a time, we used to actually have class in a classroom that had seats. And if you look at any classroom in, uh, on campus, there is actually a maximum capacity. How many seats are supposed to be in that room? And a lot of the rooms on the second floor of MC have a capacity or the number of seats is about 90. And it's always fun when the registrar assigns more than 90 students to sit in a room with 90 seats. So here's what happens. My critical section is the rooms, the room and the seats. 
There are 90 seats, which means 90 people, 90 threads can safely enter. And anything more than 90, you can come in, but you can't sit down. And since you can't sit down, you're probably going to walk around. Or not walk around. You're going to leave. Except for, you know, that time in the fall of 2019 where people started bringing lawn chairs. That was really funny. And that's actually why I started um, live streaming my lectures. Um, it was because there were so many students in the room, it was causing a fire hazard. <laughs> the lawn chair bit was really funny, though. Um, anyways, let's pretend we're going to be good citizens and we enter the room. If there's a seat, we take it. And if there's no seats, we leave and we wait and we sit there for one of the students in a seat to get up to use the washroom. And if they get up to use the washroom, we're going to run in, we're going to take their seat. That's really bad manners, but we're threads. We don't care, right? Okay. How do you manage that? So what we have is a fixed number of resources. We have 90 chairs. That means 90 threads can enter the room and sit down. How are we going to keep track of that? We could actually use a lock, by the way. Um, if you were doing something like that with a lock, let's see what it would look like here. Let's, um, let's create a new page and let's fire up my strange device here. I have so many devices with Bluetooth enabled now that I actually don't know which computer this tablet is going to pair with today. <laughs> uh, oh, well, what can you do? Anyways, so we can use a lock to solve this problem of keeping track of how many resources are available. And it's actually not that hard. You're going to have a shared global variable which keeps track of how many things are available. Yeah, my stuff doesn't want to pair today. Hey, hey, hey. Okay. Let's open VI. We'll just type it instead. So we'll have some, you know. And we start out with 90 chairs. And we're also going to need a lock. go. And uh, then what I need to do was when I enter the room, what I'm going to have to do is I'll say, okay, well, I need to check to see if there are any chairs. So I'm going to say, you know, lock, acquire, we'll acquire mutex. And if I get past this line, it means I own the lock. And then I'll say if chairs is a less than, let's have a const. I always spell unsigned wrong. Okay, I spell everything wrong. I'm bad at spelling. Um, okay, maybe we won't start the number of chairs out at 90. If the number of chairs is less than max chairs, uh, then We take the chair, and again, this is going to be pseudocode here. We call release. Otherwise, we have to wait. But this doesn't quite work, because if I wait, then I might, if, if I'm waiting for the chairs to be less than 90, well, maybe somebody else changed it on me. So this doesn't quite work. We're going to have to fix this a little bit. So what we're going to do is while the chairs is equal to the maximum number of chairs available, I need to give an opportunity to the other owners of the chairs to leave. So I'm actually going to release my lock. And then I'm going to reacquire my lock. Now, why do I release yield and then reacquire? Well, I want to give an opportunity 
for some other thread to safely change the number of chairs. And if I own the lock, then I'm the only person allowed to touch chairs, except I can't, I'm not in a chair, so I can't decrement the number in use. Once we leave the while loop, we know a chair is available, so we'll decrement the number, uh, or we'll I've gone this in the wrong order. While the number of chairs is equal to zero, as in none available, otherwise, chairs minus minus. There we go. Okay. So what is this code doing? We show up at the class, we acquire the lock, we check how many available chairs there are. If the number of chairs available is equal to zero, then I can't sit down. So I need to wait for that to change. But it can't change while I own the lock, so I release the lock, and then I'm going to yield to encourage a context switch. And then I reacquire the lock, and when I reacquire the lock, I have to check to see if the number of chairs has changed. Once the number of chairs available is greater than zero, I'm going to take a chair. So I decrement the chair counter, and then I'm done. I have a seat and I release the lock. And then, of course, to leave the room, we are going to very simply acquire the lock, increment the chairs, release the lock. That's it. So this is how we could solve this problem of keeping track of how many resources are available. That's a lot of work, though. <laughs> I don't want to do that much work. One of the interesting things about synchronization is that pretty much any task you can do with one primitive, you can do it with the other. But it doesn't mean it's pretty. And this is where our semaphore comes in. A semaphore is a special synchronization primitive that keeps track of the number of resources are available. Now, you don't actually have access to the counter. The counter is hidden. It's inside the semaphore uh, structure away from you. But you can call an acquire function to try to get a resource. And if there are no resources available, then the semaphore puts you to sleep. And if there are resources available, it will decrement its internal counter. When the number of resources reaches zero, any requesting threads will end up sleeping. When you release the resource, it increments the counter. So the implementation of a semaphore is almost identical to a lock with two really big exceptions. The first really big exception is instead of keeping track of whether it is held or not, we simply have a counter. If the counter is zero, there are no resources available. And if the counter is greater than one, then there are some, or sorry, greater than zero, there are some number of resources available. The other big difference is that a semaphore does not keep track of who owns it. And that's because many people could own resources, and we don't really care who they are. I mean, one of the ways that you could think about this is somebody steals your laptop, and then you get it back. Did you really care who stole it? Or are you just happy that you got the laptop back? I'd personally just be happy I got the laptop back. Now, in order to do the same bit of code... So let's say I wanted to implement um, enter and leave room using a semaphore now. So this was using locks. Now let's do it with the semaphore. With the semaphore, I'm going to set the initial number of resources in its uh, constructor. And now enter room is going to acquire the semaphore. And then when I leave the room, I release. Oh, isn't that so nice? Look at how much code I just simplified. Do you see why I like semaphores? <laughs> They're great. They're awesome. And now you're probably sitting there wondering, why didn't you write acquire and release? Why did you write the random uppercase letters P and V? Hmm, because the creator of semaphores didn't take 
CS135 and didn't lose 50% of their assignment grades due to bad naming. So, why P and V? <laughs> there is a reason, by the way. Uh, it's not just random. Uh, okay, why P and V? So, the gentleman who invented the semaphore uh, was Dutch, is my understanding. And he was rather fascinated by trains. And so he named the acquire and release functions for the Dutch words uh, related to train signals. So my understanding, and I'm saying understanding because I am, I cannot say these words um, and I don't speak this language, but my understanding is that um, P is for this word here, which is supposed to mean passing or something. And V is for this word I have no idea how to pronounce, which is supposed to mean release. So in a semaphore, we don't talk about acquire and release. We P and V the semaphore. So we're turning letters into verbs, apparently. So Ping and Ving semaphores is what we do. We acquire and release locks, and we P and V semaphores. And if you get confused as to whether P is acquire or release, everybody does. So P is the acquire and V is the release function. All right. A couple things that you should know also is that those functions are effectively atomic, which means that even if they are interrupted, the behavior will not change. So they are protected. And if you're still struggling with implementing locks, literally go into OS 161, take the semaphore implementation, copy and paste it into the lock implementation and make a few changes. It doesn't take much. Now, that's a really beautiful solution to this problem of keeping track of resources. But there's actually a bunch of things that you can do with semaphores. Semaphores are really, really cool. There's a reason why I like them. First off, there's this concept called a binary semaphore. Now, all of these things I'm about to talk about, they are not separate implementations. They are simply different ways that we can use a semaphore that gives us a lot greater flexibility. Uh, with synchronization. So the first is the binary semaphore. So a binary semaphore is one that has a single resource. And if you have a single resource, you behave like a lock. So I could, for example, going back here, I could create a binary semaphore. I create it with initially one resource. And then I could do this. Just like that. And there we go. Now I am using a bi this semaphore as a binary semaphore, which is used as a lock. Now, binary semaphores and locks are different. Even though this awful offers mutual exclusion, there's a couple things that you have to be careful with. Semaphores don't keep track of ownership. So you can release a binary semaphore even if you don't own it. Another thing to keep track of is when you set in the constructor of the semaphore the initial count, that is not setting the maximum number of resources that are available. That's setting the initial number of resources. The interesting thing about a semaphore is if you create one with initially zero resources, that doesn't mean it's an unusable semaphore. It just means that you have to call V to produce a resource before you call P. Think of it this way. When a baker shows up in the morning, their shelves to the bakery, they have no cupcakes on the shelf. The number of resources they have initially is zero, but that doesn't prevent them from adding cupcakes to the shelf. And the V function and the behavior of a semaphore, you can start out with no resources and you can call V as many times as you want to create those resources and add them to the system. So when you're using a, a semaphore as a lock, you need to make extra careful that you don't call V uh, more than when you're supposed to. So only call it once. 
And uh, you also have to make sure that you call it in the right spot. Otherwise, your binary semaphore turns into a counting semaphore and you lose your mutual exclusion. So it's on you to make sure you're using a binary semaphore correctly. And it takes a bit more effort. So binary semaphore. It's effectively mutual exclusion with a look. Uh, then we have a counting semaphore. So a counting semaphore is any semaphore that uh, has an arbitrary number of resources. So maybe a semaphore has 50 resources. Maybe it has 10,000. Maybe it has zero. So that's just a regular old counting semaphore. And then we have this really cool thing called a barrier semaphore. And again, these are not separate implementations. This is the same implementation, just different ways to use it. So I want to, for a moment, go over into the source code for OS161. And uh, let's see, where do I want to go? So I'm in the kernel. And I want to go. into sync probs. And I'm going to go into traffic.c. Traffic.c is the driver for the big problem on assignment one. Now, what this question is, is we have a four-way intersection. All right, we have a quick question here on Twitch. You can add more than the specified max to a semaphore. Yes, you absolutely can, because when you create a semaphore and you pass it an initial uh, number of resources, that's not setting the maximum. That's just saying, how many do you start with? And our semaphore implementation and many semaphore implementations don't then compare uh, when you V it, when you add a resource, it's not saying, okay, uh, am I at the maximum number of resources or not? That doesn't happen. Um, I'm not saying there aren't other implementations of semaphores out there that don't do that. It's just the general concept of a semaphore doesn't do that. There's no maximum theoretically. Um, so you can start with 50 resources and then you can produce 10,000 more and now you have 10,050 resources. It's totally allowable. It's actually quite useful. Okay, so the traffic simulation problem, I'm sure you've heard about it on Reddit where people post uh, lovely GIFs of uh, cars getting in accidents in intersections or coming so close to getting in an accident in an intersection and it's anxiety inducing. Um, what this problem is, is we've given you a four-way intersection and I'm going to have to apologize. I actually don't have a driver's license. I've never read the driver's handbook. I'm never going to. So if my understanding of how actual intersections work is off. That's my excuse. We have a four-way intersection and there's a traffic light and cars are going to come from all the directions and try to travel to the other directions. And what we want to make sure is that the traffic is going through the intersection without getting into an accident. Now right now we only permit one car in the intersection at a time which as you can imagine we're a class in actual physical session trying to drive to the university could be a real pain in the butt. So, um, hey, I finally brought, got my uh, tablet to come up. So what we want you to do is right now the intersection is protected by a binary semaphore. We want you to make it so that more than one car can be in the intersection at a time. We want you to improve the throughput of this intersection. So we have this uh, file traffic.c, which you're not allowed to modify but it actually is going to be responsible for spawning the threads and each of those threads is going to spawn some number of vehicles from some random direction. Now, once all of the cars have gone through the intersection, we're going to collect some statistics about how long it took them to go through the intersection and, and all of those things. So this here at the very bottom, traffic simulation, is actually what's going to um, do the body of the work. So what you see here is um, we are forking off the threads. Each of those threads is going to spawn some number of vehicles. And then we need to wait for all of these threads to complete so that we can compute our statistics on what was the average wait time, what was the maximum wait time. So this thread needs to wait. And if you've been looking at things like uh, 
SY2 or any of those thread tests, um, you may have noticed P's and V's all over the place. Well, that's actually semaphores. And we are using those semaphores as a barrier to simulate the join behavior for threads. So we want this thread here to wait for all of the forked threads to complete before this thread itself continues on with the execution. So I need all of the other threads that are spawning vehicles to finish before I collect the statistics. Because it doesn't make sense to collect the statistics if the threads are still running, because I would have incomplete results. So this is actually an example of a semaphore being used as a barrier. A barrier semaphore starts out with zero resources because no threads are finished. And then as each thread finishes, if we actually go there, you will see the very last thing that each thread does before it terminates is it Vs the barrier. Now, to make this work, what we have to do is we have to P the semaphore the same number of times as there are threads that we're waiting on. So if I'm waiting on 10 threads to complete, then I need to P my semaphore 10 times. And then when all 10 threads have V'd the semaphore, I will finally exit this loop and I can collect the statistics because I know that all the threads have completed. So this semaphore is behaving as a barrier, which kind of gives us that join-like behavior. So that's kind of fun. And I think you can see now why I might like a semaphore so much. It could be uh, a lock and, and give us mutual exclusion. We can use it to keep track of resources. And we can use it for things like barriers. And it's very simple to use. All right. So here's an example of using mutual, uh, of doing mutual exclusion with a semaphore. Question on Twitch, you can have a negative number of resources for semaphore. No, no, you can't actually. Um, so if the semaphore's count is zero, we do not, that means there's no resources available. And we are going to just put the thread asleep instead of decrementing it. The problem with having a negative value, like negative and positive values, is if the value of the semaphore is negative, and we go to sleep if there are zero or less resources available, then the threads that are waiting for the semaphore to have a resource will ha actually have to wait for the number of resources to be greater than zero. So if you have negative 100 resources, on 100 threads waiting, you actually have to wait for somebody to produce 100 resources in order to continue. So we actually have the minimum value is zero. We never go negative. It's again, it's not to say that there isn't an implementation of a semaphore that does this. It's just to say the general concept of a semaphore does. There are lots of specialized implementations. All right, so here's an example of using a binary semaphore. Again, this is just to replace a lock. In this particular use here, it's not a big deal um, because we're just protecting a single line of code. Not easy to screw up. All right, so let's actually dive into a bigger problem with semaphores, um, a place where they're really beautiful for solving things, and that is one of these famous synchronization problems. So if you take 343, and I really recommend you do, especially in today's world where everything uh, uses multi-threading. I mean, we have had CPUs with hyper-threading since 2003. My first laptop um, had a hyper-threaded Pentium 4. There's two threads, right? Double core processors have been around for a while. So we, we Synchronization is and concurrency is a big deal. So take 343. Um, but there are lots of different synchronization problems that are pretty famous. There's the dining philosophers. Uh, there's the barbershop. There's the bakery. There's all kinds of them. One of the most common ones there, the most famous ones, is the producers and consumers. And the idea behind producers and consumers is you have this finite buffer. And you could think of it kind of as... Um, well, I'm going to do a different one this year. So let's suppose that um, you're a bakery and you have a shelf, a display. 
The display is a bounded buffer because it can only fit so many cupcakes. If you haven't clued in, I love cupcakes. <laughs> so you have a display and it can only fit so many cupcakes. So it's a bounded buffer. Now, does it make sense to produce, i.e. to go bake some cupcakes, if there's no room in your display case to put those cupcakes? No, it doesn't. Because if there's no room in your display case for the cupcakes, then you're just gonna sit there in the kitchen and have to eat them all yourself. And that's a really good way to get diabetes. Um, <laughs> and die or just get really sick, so don't do that. All right, so the baker would have to throw out those cupcakes effectively is what I'm saying. Okay. So if the shelf, if the display case is full, we don't want to produce any cupcakes. At the same time, the customer is the consumer. They're coming in and there's no point in then coming into your bakery if the display case is empty because there's no cupcakes available. So why bother showing up? So the producer is waiting for the display case to have some free space before they actually put some new cupcakes out. And the consumer is waiting for the display case to be not empty because they want to wait for cupcakes that they can purchase. Producers and consumers. So we can actually solve this problem using some semaphores. And it's actually quite simple. So we make note that there's actually two different resources. To the producer, the resource is empty space in the display case. So spaces are the producer's resource. And to the consumer, the resource is the cupcakes on the shelf. So how many cupcakes are there? So we're going to create two semaphores because there are two different resources. Remember, we can't actually access the counter of the semaphore, nor do we want to because it's a shared variable and we don't want to be messing around with that and causing a race condition in our semaphore. So you could, could and should consider the counter in the semaphore to be a private protected thing. You're probably hearing a lot of laughing. <laughs> my kids are probably down in the basement. My daughter's doing this uh, virtual school and I'm guessing they're doing a dance right now. She's six. <laughs> Let her laugh a little. <laughs> All right. So we've got the resource for the producer as being the spaces and the resource for the consumer as being how many cupcakes are available. So then the producer is going to pee spaces because it needs to wait for a space to be available. When a space is available, it can add a cupcake to the shelf and then it's going to not V spaces because it didn't produce a space, it consumed a space. It produced an item. It made a cupcake. It made an item for the consumer. So we pee spaces to get a space on the display shelf, but we produced an item for the consumer. So we V items to increment that counter. Pee spaces to get the space, V items to produce the item. All right. Then in the consumer, the consumer wants a cupcake, so they pee the items. When they get in, i.e. they are, there is an item available, they can remove it from the shelf, pay for it, of course, and by removing it from the shelf, they made a resource for the baker. They made some space on the shelf, so they V spaces. Now, here's an interesting statement about this code here. It's actually broken. There's a race condition still. However, it's not with respect to the producer and the consumer trying to put items on the shelf and there's no space or take items from the shelf when there's nothing there. The problem that we have is that it's entirely possible for the producer and consumer to be accessing this buffer at the same time. And if there's only one item in the buffer and you try to put it in at the same time as somebody is taking it, an item out, you're going to run into a race condition. So we actually need to fix this code by adding mutual exclusion on the buffer itself. So we should only be allowed, like you don't want the baker putting an item in the display case at the same time that the consumer is trying to take an item. So um, 
we're going to put some mutual exclusion around access to the display case. You can do that with a binary sum for, you can do it with a lock, it doesn't matter. Put it inside right around this buffer bit though, right around here. All right, now let's look at the implementation of a semaphore. Now this is code that I've taken straight out of OS 161. And you'll notice here, this looks awfully similar to the pseudocode we talked about for locks, because it is. It's the reason why I told you to copy and paste it and change it. The big difference here is we're not setting up an owner and we just have this counter. That's the big difference. There's some other fine, tiny differences about uh, interrupt disabling that we don't need for locks, but we'll go, we'll, we'll talk about that some other time. All right. So you see here that um, the semaphore implementation is similar to a lock. Now what I want to do is I want to go into detail as to why the WCHAN lock must happen before the spin lock release, which happens before we go to sleep if the resource is not available. And I'm going to go into detail for this for the semaphore, but the same reasoning is true for the lock implementation as well. So let's suppose for a moment that the WCHAN lock is in the wrong spot. So now it's going to go spin lock release, WCHAN lock, WCHAN sleep. And let's observe what happens when, the th when it is in that order. So we call spin lock release, so there's no resources available. I need to go to sleep. We call spin lock release and interrupts are, are enabled so we can be preempted here, so we get a context switch. Now let's suppose that the second thread is the thread that is producing the resource. So it calls V and let's suppose that it um, increments the count, it's gonna, it's going to complete its execution of the V function. It increments the count to one, and then it calls wake one, releases the spin lock, and then it's done. So it does a context switch back to us. Now, keep in mind at this point, the number of resources in the semaphore that are available is one. We return to thread one. Thread one still believes that the number of resources the semaphore has is zero. And it continues from after the spin lock release, it calls WCHAN lock and WCHAN sleep. So thread one is now asleep on a semaphore, but the number of resources that semaphore has is one. So there was no reason for thread one to fall asleep. But because of the ordering, the incorrect order of release and lock here, we end up falling asleep on resource on a something that has a resource available because we weren't we didn't protect things properly now how should this actually behave if we have it in the correct order as in the course notes so exact same situation here uh some force count is zero thread one calls spin lock release and then there's a context switch now thread two calls v it calls spin lock acquire and it increments the count, but when um, and it, when it calls WCHAN wake one, it has to wait. There's going to be a context switch here. So the context switch, and it was hard to draw this here, actually happens inside of WCHAN wake one. And we're going to go back to thread one here, except, th and the reason why this context switch is happening is because thread one owns the lock on the wake channel. So thread two can't actually wake anybody up because the lock is owned by somebody else. So we end up context switching back to thread one, eventually. Thread one then calls WCHAN sleep and puts itself to sleep on the wait channel. At the very bottom of WCHAN sleep, we release the WCHAN lock. So there's a context switch then back to thread two. Thread two is going to wake up at the beginning of wake one, and then it's going to acquire the wait channel lock inside of wake one, and then wake you up and put you back onto the ready pool. 
So and then it releases the spin lock. And now thread two has woken thread one. Thread one will then try to acquire the semaphore again. And hey, it now recognizes that the resource is available. So the reason why you have to lock the weight channel before you release the spin lock is to prevent you from running into the situation where you fall asleep on a resource that's available because somebody is trying to release at the same time you're trying to sleep. If release, um, if you're trying to release at the same time as somebody waking, you can fall asleep on a resource that's available and nobody may wake you up. That would be bad. All right, so there we have it. That's semaphores. You don't have to implement them. They're already implemented for you. So now I want to introduce then the final synchronization primitive we're going to talk about in this course. And there are a lot more. We're just not this course. Uh, and that's condition variables. Now this one you are responsible for implementing. Now a condition variable works in conjunction with a law. And the idea is you are inside of a critical section protected by a lock and the shared variable, you need it to equal five before you can continue in the critical section. But the lock that you own is the lock that protects that shared variable. So you need a way of safely waiting in your critical section for, the lock, for that shared variable to change. And that's what a condition variable is going to let us do. Now, what do I mean by that? So here's an example I like to use for that. Let's suppose you go to a bar, if we could go to bars these days, or if you're interested in that, I don't know, I don't need a bar to drink. I've got a whole pile of whiskey sitting up above my head here. Um, <laughs> but anyways, let's suppose you go to a bar and you sit down at a bar stool and um, you've got, you know, your, your pint of beer sitting in front of you. This is not beer, this is lemonade. <laughs> um, and uh, you, you grab your glass. You now have mutual exclusion on the glass. You have the lock on the glass because it is in your hand. So you go, you grab the glass and you bring it up to your mouth and you're like, oh, it's empty. I know my cup is empty. <laughs> it's empty but I want some beer and I don't have, I have no beer in my cup. Here's the thing. The bartender sees that you have no beer in your cup, but they can't fill your cup up because you have the mutual exclusion. You have the lock on the glass. What a condition variable lets you do is simultaneously put the cup down, release the lock and fall asleep. And then the bartender can pick up the cup, getting the lock on it, fill it back up again, and then when the bartender has filled the glass, since they've changed the condition, they are going to toss it down the counter at you, releasing their hold on it, releasing the lock. The glass hits you in the head. You wake up and you simultaneously pick up the glass and take your drink. So that's what the condition variable is going to let us do. It's going to let us safely fall asleep in our critical section so that while releasing the lock so that some other thread can change the condition for us. There are three functions associated with the condition variable. There is weight. And this is where the majority of the work actually happens. This is where we are going to be simultaneously releasing the lock and falling asleep. And then there is signal, which is going to cause one waiting thread to wake up and broadcast, which unblocks all threads waiting on the condition. Now, let's look at using a condition variable. We can actually use condition variables and I've actually kind of already showed you how to use them when I showed you how to do stuff, um, do the resource counting with a lock because doing it with a condition variable and a lock is quite similar. We'll, we'll get there, but let's look at how to solve producers and consumers with a condition variable. Okay. So first off, what are our conditions? We actually don't pass the conditions to the condition variable. Uh, it's our responsibility to check the condition. We are simply, if the condition is not met, going to call wait or signal appropriately. Our condition variable doesn't care what the condition is. 
It's just really a place to wait for the condition to be true. So there are two conditions. The producer's condition is it's waiting for the count, that is the number of spaces in the buffer, to be less than n. We're waiting for free space. And the, the consumer is waiting for the count of items in the buffer to be greater than zero. So we have two conditions. We're going to have one condition variable for each condition because those are different things. And we don't want threads waiting on different things to be in the same weight channel. That makes no sense. So what we're going to do is um, before we solve producers and consumers, well, let's just jump ahead and solve it. So looking at producers and consumers, and I'm going to come back and, um, well, actually, this is a bit complicated. Let's see how we might solve problems uh, without producers and consumers first. So let's pretend we don't have a condition variable. How am I going to solve the problem with just one condition? Backtrack a little here. Okay. So let's suppose that we were able to go on campus and we needed to create an app uh, to check whether it is safe for us to go from one class to another class. And the only way that we know it is safe is if the number of geese on our path is equal to zero. So we have a shared variable that is the number of geese on our path. And we have a lock to check the number of geese. Now, I can only go to my next class if the number of geese on the path is zero. So I acquire the lock. If the number of geese is greater than zero, I need to wait. But that's, that's why we need the condition variable. Because if I'm waiting while I own this mutex, nobody can change the number of geese, including the geese. So we can modify this to actually do that. So again, again, we just have a number of geese on the path and then we have a mutex to protect it. We acquire the lock and then in a while loop, we check if the number of geese is greater than zero. If it's greater than zero, it's not safe. And therefore I need to uh, safely wait. And in this case, I'm going to spin as my wait mechanism. I release the lock so that some other, we could get a context switch here. And you can encourage a context switch here by calling yield actually right after release. And what I'm then going to do is immediately after release, I'm going to call acquire. And the idea is we're giving an opportunity for another thread, i.e. a goose, to come in, acquire the lock, and change the number of geese. And then eventually, when the number of geese is equal to zero, we will be down here and we can do whatever we need to do. We can walk. But this spins, this waiting is spinning. So I'm going to sit there and repeatedly call release, acquire, check, release, acquire, check, release, acquire, check, release, acquire, check. So I will block when I'm waiting for the lock, but while I own the lock and uh, while I can easily acquire the lock, I am effectively spinning here. This is a really ugly way of doing it. And this is what the condition variable lets us do. Instead of sitting there and spinning, Spinning, going release, acquire, release, acquire. When the condition main have not changed, we can use a condition variable instead. So I have the CV. The condition I'm waiting for is zero geese, so I've called my CV zero geese. I still need the lock. So I acquire the lock. I check my condition, which is, is the number of geese greater than zero? If the number of geese is greater than zero, then I have to go to sleep, so I call CV wait. I am waiting for geese to equal zero. This looks like it's spinning, but it's not. Because it is going to put the calling thread to sleep until another thread changes the condition to geese equal to zero, and then calls CV signal. Only then will I wake up. Now, why must I then recheck the condition? Because most uses, most, not all, of a condition variable, it is entirely possible that somebody could change the condition again before I get a chance to actually run. So I still need to actually do this here. 
But instead of spending the majority of my time busy waiting, now I'm spending the majority of my time actually sleeping. And we can use that little example there to solve our producers and consumers. Now again, we have two conditions, not full, which is what the producer is waiting for the buffer to be, and not empty, which is what the consumer is waiting for the buffer to be. Hmm, that was interesting. <laughs> Somebody just controlled the volume on my tablet. Uh, why don't you need to release the lock while waiting? Because CV wait does it. We'll talk about the implementation of CV wait in just a few minutes. All right. So, how are we going to do this? Well, what we're going to do is so we've got one CV for each of our conditions. We've got our mutex, our lock, and we've got our counter. So the producer is going to acquire the lock and it's going to check its condition. The condition it needs to check is, is the buffer full? If the buffer is full, we call CV wait on not full. That's what we are waiting for. When the buffer is finally not full, we'll be down here. We can add the item to the buffer safely. We increment the count to indicate there's now an item in the buffer, but because we just incremented count, we have changed the condition for the consumer. So we call CV signal on not empty because the buffer is no longer empty. And then we release our lock. And similarly, consume acquires the lock. It's going to check the condition is the count equal to zero. And if the count is zero, there are no items. So I wait for the buffer to be not empty. Once the buffer is not empty, I remove the item from the buffer. I decrement the counter, but by decrementing the counter, now I've changed the condition for the producer. So I call signal on not full because the buffer is no longer full. And I release the lock. So there you go. That is another way that we can solve producers and consumers. Now, my preference is to use semaphores. I, I much prefer the semaphore solution uh, to the condition variable solution. All right, now, how do we implement CV weight? So let's go back over to our notebook here. Now that I actually have my tablet up and running. So there are three functions that we need for a condition variable. We have weight, we have signal, and we have broadcast. Now signal and broadcast are really easy functions. These in your code should be like two lines each. They're really tiny um, because signal well, let's talk about this. A condition variable. It is a place for threads to wait until a condition is true, which means that a condition variable should have its own wait channel. So when we call signal and broadcast, we are waking one or all of the threads waiting on that wait channel. That's it. So these should really only be a couple lines of code. It's the wait function that's the complicated one. So how, what does wake do? So wait has to effectively, I can't spell. Ooh, <laughs> that's probably spelled really wrong, I apologize. So wait, we want to simultaneously release the lock and fall asleep. What we're really saying is we want to do this, make sure that we release the lock and fall asleep and the conditions can't change while that's happening. So what we need to do inside of CV wait then is CV wait is past the lock. So we are going to need to release the lock and go to sleep. 
Now here's the trick. When we return from CV weight, we need to own that lock because we are trying to safely leave our critical section and go to sleep to let some other thread run it. I don't then, when I want to return from CV weight, have to manually recall call lock acquire. So actually, what's going to happen is inside of CV weight, just before we return from CV weight, we're going to acquire the lock again. So that when we return from CV weight, we own the lock. So here's the trick. When you enter CV weight, you own the lock. When you leave CV weight, you own the lock. But in the body of CV weight, you don't because you're asleep. Now, what lock? The lock that is passed in. So a CV actually doesn't have a lock of its own. It doesn't need a lock because you're going to pass it one. There should be no spin locks in a condition variable at all. No spin locks, no locks. The lock that we're going to use to do this little trick is passed as a parameter into CV weight. Now going to sleep, I need to safely release the lock and go to sleep without anybody else making the condition change while I'm doing that. So remember that we might want to lock the weight channel before we release our lock, before we go to sleep. Now, our CV doesn't actually need anything else. So our CV will have a name, our CV has a weight channel, and it doesn't actually need anything else. So that's it. So that is a pseudocode of what goes on in the body of CV weight. And I'm going to let you figure out the finer details of how you make that actually happen. But in our last couple minutes here, there's one more thing with conditioned variables I want to talk to you about. And that is, um, you will note that signal and broadcast both also have a lock parameter. And the comments in the code indicate that you need to own the lock that is passed into signal and broadcast. You don't actually. <laughs> in our implementation of lock, that's not necessary. So we are not going to be checking if you own the lock or not inside of signal and broadcast. Why is it not important? So, I mean, you should own the lock, so you should check it. But in most cases of a condition variable, it doesn't actually matter. Because most of the time when we call CV wait, we have to do it in a loop. And since we do it in a loop, we're checking the condition when we wake up anyways. So it didn't really matter whether we own the lock when we woke anybody up. I have a very long winded explanation of this. Uh, it's posted at, in the extra sample problems, extra guides thread on Piazza. I don't expect that you know this. It's just some extra information about what happens if you don't own the lock in signal and broadcast. I don't care if you decide to own the lock in signal and broadcast or not. It shouldn't cause any problems for you. So then the last thing I want to show you is how do you test your condition variables? So the condition variable test is, got my mouse on my wrong screen here. The condition variable test is SY3. And there's only one CV test, that's SY3. So I'm going to go into test again. And I'm going to go into sync test.c. I'm going to go to line 261. This is CV test thread. And again, it's going to make use of those three global shared variables, testval1, testval2, and testval3. And it's going to do some busy work in a loop and then compare some values and some times. 
don't worry, this doesn't make a lot of sense, this code, but um, now what's interesting is uh, we're setting test val one to equal test val one plus the number of threads minus one modulo the number of threads. And if the test val one's value is not equal to your thread number, then you have to wait. So we are waiting for test val one to be equal to our thread number. That's effectively what's going on here. And then we're going to spawn like, um, I don't remember how many threads it is. It's eight, I think. And it's going to do some magic. So what should we expect that the outcome of this looks like? Well, let's go over here and let's run SY3, which is the CV test. So this is what you should get if you have correctly implemented semaphores. You should see 32 threads sound off in reverse five times. 32 threads in reverse five times. If you get any other output, you have a correctly implemented condition variable. So for example, we can go back to um, assignment zero. And here's an example when you don't have CVs of what kind of nonsense you might get if your CVs aren't implemented correctly. So SY3 is your condition variable test. Do make sure that you use it. Um, and again, because this is dealing with multiple threads, you're going to need to run this test many, many, many times. All right, so that's it for semaphores and condition variables today. In our next episode, we are going to polish off our section on um, synchronization. So I have a sample problem that we will do. Uh, and for those of you sitting at home, the sample problem is SEM to CV. Let's open it up here one more time. So I'm going to go into my directory. And of course, I can't find, no, it's not in Bernard's directory. Um, Handouts, there it is. So SEM to CV, this is the one that we will do tomorrow. So this is, we've solved a synchronization problem with semaphores, we want you to convert it to locks and condition variables. We'll take that up in episode number seven. So review of semaphores and CVs in episode seven. And we're also going to finally discuss what volatile is because we are going to discuss the other two sources of race conditions and how we solve them. And then we will finish off our section on synchronization by talking about deadlocks. And then after that, on episode eight, we'll start a new topic. So we will see you next week for episode number seven. <laughs>